What's going on, everybody? Teej back again for round two of my updated 2023 NFL mock draft. Excited to bring this to you. I'm going to go ahead and actually do something a little different here. I'm going to go ahead and show the best players still on the board as we get to the Pittsburgh Steelers on the clock at pick 32. But of course, if you missed yesterday's video, be sure to go back out and check out round one. You can also see the picks in the bottom right of your screen of what I did in yesterday's video. But nonetheless, hopefully you guys enjoy. Hit the like button if you do. If you're new around here want to see more draft content, hit that big red subscribe button and Let's go ahead and waste no more of your time. Let's start with the Pittsburgh Steelers at pick 32. This is one I've made uh, plenty of times. Anton Harrison, man, uh, you know, as a fan of this team, obviously I'm a little biased here, but this is an immediate upgrade over Dan Moore. Uh, we saw Kenny Pickett rolling out right way too much last year. So bringing in a guy who has got three years of starting experience at Oklahoma, plenty of pass blocking sets under his belt, tried and true, make him an immediate starter there at left tackle. And maybe Dan Moore can fight for a spot at right tackle, or he just becomes an experienced swing tackle, which that's becoming more and more valuable with every year that goes by in the NFL. So just an immediate upgrade for Pittsburgh. And I have a really interesting second, second rounder for the Steelers. That one I haven't done quite uh, yet, I don't think, on the channel. So we get the Chicago Bears at 33. This came from the trade with a number one overall pick. Yesterday it was a pick swap at one and two, plus uh, Chicago getting pick 33 from Houston. It could totally be a lot more, but again, I'm at the, uh, the discretion of the mockdraftdatabase.com simulator, so don't yell at me down below in the comment section unless you really want to, then I understand. Uh, then we get the Chicago Bears at 33, and this is a wide receiver I've had them take a handful of times, but man, Jackson Smith and Jigba, kind of like how I was talking about Miles Murphy yesterday, where it's like, man, that's the place I want to see him go. Chicago's where I want to see JSN go. Uh, I, I think if there's any place I could have him drop into a roster, it'd be Chicago. Play him in the slot with Darno Mooney and uh, Chase Claypool on the outside and Valus Jones Jr. as the satellite guy. Man, that's a really well-rounded, skilled, and young wide receiver room. Now, I wasn't as high on Valus Jones Jr., but he's got burst and he's good after the catch, so he's got his role. Darno Mooney can do a lot of those same satellite work, but also great downfield speed. He's got the deep route running to go with it. Claypool can win in contested catch spots. Sometimes, I don't know, he's kind of iffy for me, uh, but you know, big, tall, strong athlete can work down the field, has enough speed. And then you add JSN as the guy who's not as fleet of foot as those other three, but Really sharp route runner, really good at adjusting to get the ball in the air, can fight off defenders, soft hands, can sink into soft spots in the zone, high football IQ. A lot of those little things that aren't as flashy as a guy who runs a 4-2, right? That's what JSN does. And because he's going to run 4-5, four, 4-6, four, or so I'm anticipating, that's the stuff you have to do. And that's what JSN brings to the table. So I like him as an early day two guy more so than a late one. I think right here at 33, man, again, if I could add him to any roster, I think Chicago, especially if they get pick 33 from Houston, that's, that's the perfect spot for him to go. Now we get to the Arizona Cardinals, and we're going to go into your offensive line. Same pick I made last week, John Michael Smith. I mean, this is a team that needs to improve its interior offensive line, and especially with the new head coach coming in. And I think Jonathan Gannon, that whole front office, I think they all understand, hey, this is at least a year or two uh, worth of doing their work in the offseason before we really get this rebuild kicked into high gear. So drafting in the trenches is something, you know, like go back to when Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes were brought in for Detroit. A lot of work put in the trenches. And I can see something very similar for Arizona. And uh, yeah, I think John Michael Smith's getting the chance to draft the best center in this draft class. That's a that's a big addition, especially considering you have a shorter quarterback, so you need a clean pocket right in front of him so for him to get a clean view of the middle of the field and be able to make those intermediate throws. So this is a sense, this is the pick that makes a lot of sense for Kyler, for the direction of this organization, understanding its timetable, but also just addressing a huge area of need. And JSM, I think 34 feels about right. That's funny. We had JSN go 33 and then JSM go 34. So didn't mean for that to happen. But at 35, let's give the Indianapolis Colts Keon White, another big winner uh, from the senior poll. This tight end turned edge rusher, ODU transferred to Georgia Tech. And as he's learned the position, he's just figured more and more out, right? Like he starts as this guy who's a high-level run defender, a twitchy athlete, gets to the backfield quick. And then he goes to Georgia Tech and he still has that. But then now he's starting to add that pass rush prowess, seven and a half sacks last year with Georgia Tech. So I think this is a guy who's kind of just now hitting his strides. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to pair that type of an athlete up with Quiddy Pay on the other side, who is an absolute freak of an athlete, much better run defender right now than he is a pass rusher. But nonetheless, still some time for Pay to develop there. But this is a position that, you know, Indianapolis has been trying to figure out for some time. So let's continue to take swings of the bat. Let's try to find that edge rush partner to dance with Quiddy Pay on the other side of the defensive line. Give DeForest Buckner some help as well. Uh, I'm really intrigued by Keon White, if, especially if he falls into the second round. And the Rams at pick 36. Going back to the interior offensive line, Luke Weipler, I mean, he's a perfect fit for that, you know, zone blocking scheme uh, or gap scheme, however you want to describe it. Uh, but yeah, an upgrade there at center. Only 300 pounds, so he's much more in that, you know, Cam Jurgens, Tyler Linderbaum, light from last year, those lighter centers. But dude, those guys on the move 
can move folks. Uh, and I think Luke Weipler brings a lot of that to the table. Also, you look at his PFF grades during his time at Ohio State, and he's been nothing but fantastic or elite. Uh, so yeah, I think it's an immediate upgrade there for the Rams. They have got to address that interior offensive line. And, you know, it, it's it, this is tough because I never want to compare somebody to one of the best centers I ever got to watch play football, and that's Travis Frederick. But there was this time where Dallas had the best offensive line in football. It was unquestioned. Then Travis Frederick has this crazy injury. He misses an entire season. And Dallas's offensive line was still good, but it wasn't quite the same. Frederick then comes back from that injury, and Dallas is right back at number one. Like, they are the best unit. So don't underestimate the value that a top-tier, high-end center can bring to the table. And I think if Weipler works out, that's the same type of impact he could have, specifically on the interior part of that Rams offensive line. So we get to the Seattle Seahawks at 37. I'm going to go to Diane Henley. Uh, not a linebacker that maybe a whole lot of people are talking about, but again, a guy who played pretty well at the Senior Bowl. Really twitchy guy. There's not a, I don't want to say twitchy because there's another linebacker tomorrow that we'll talk about that that dude is textbook twitchy. Like Dorian Williams, uh, there, there are a few linebackers in this class that move like him, but Henley is not too, too far away, and just a guy who's so well-rounded, I think can make an immediate impact. It's kind of like what we talked about with Tyree Wilson yesterday. Yes, the Seahawks have a top-five pick, but that's not their pick. This is a team that made the playoffs last year, so getting a guy like Diane Henley who could partner up with Jordan Brooks, and, and I think some of the, the weaknesses of Brooks' games kind of could be counteracted by some of the strengths of Henley's game, specifically in coverage. So I am fascinated to see by this type of pairing um, and what that could do for the middle of that Seattle defense. I also think Jamal Adams, especially with Ryan Neal looking good last year, and you still have Quandre Dick, maybe Jamal Adams does some more at linebacker, uh, potentially. Uh, but nonetheless, I still think linebacker's a need. And here at 37, you know, Henley's maybe not a name I've talked about a whole lot on this channel, but I think right here, somewhere between 35 to 55, is where he's going to ultimately end up going. So I think here for Seattle, it makes a lot of sense. Then we get to the Raiders at 38. And I mean, I didn't envision a world where I just had Cam Smith fall into the second round, but my oh my, I have made it happen somehow, some way. This is a loaded corner class and someone's going to fall. And I have him and Keely Ringo falling into the second round. And those are two guys that I would more than happily, uh, more than happily describe as first round talent. So uh, Cam Smith, and we're actually going to talk about another South Carolina corner in tomorrow's video, but uh, really talented corner duo there for the Gamecocks. But you know, for Cam Smith, uh, six foot, right around 190 pounds, it's just a lot of little things right. Maybe not the twitchiest athlete, may not be the most incredible press man guy. Like, you look at J.C. Horn, and it's like, dude, that dude is an awesome athlete, and his man press ability is next. I mean, it's it's number one, and it's not even close back in that 2021 draft class. I'm not saying Cam Smith's quite that, but he does look really, really comfortable and off coverage, so I think he's got the ability to fit into whatever defense. I think it's a really nice fit for Patrick Graham, a guy who blends his coverages at a really good level. You know, it's a pretty even mix between cover three, man, uh, you know, cover two, cover four, all that sort of stuff. So Cam Smith and his, you know, diversity in game, I think fits with what Patrick Graham is looking for in a corner, and plus, I mean, He's there at 38. You just spread the card in. And I even thought about Keely Ringo here for Carolina. But instead, I'm going to go edge. I'm going to go Andre Carter. I mean, if you're a Panthers fan, how many times have you heard me say this is like a second swing of the bat against your Tur Gross Matos? But I seriously want to see this team add that power. Uh, you know, uh, it's not that Brian Burns is small because he is like six foot five, but. He's not 260 pounds. That's what Andre Carter is. So I'm just looking for a different body there on the edge, essentially, is what I'm trying to get to. And a guy who wins with strength, right? Brian Burns wins with speed, bend, and being that finesse rusher. Carter, he, he, he's got speed off the line, but he turns that explosiveness into power, and he wants to run right through a tackle. So I think this is just giving the Carolina defense the opportunity to mix match and play weakness against an opposing tackle. Hey, this guy struggles against speed. Okay, cool. We're going to have Brian Burns line up against him. Or this guy really has uh, a hard time against tackles or, excuse me, edge rushers that win with you know, strength and their arms and their arm length. Okay, cool. We got Andre Carter and six foot, 260 pounds coming at that dude. So I think it just allows you to do whatever you need to do there on the defensive side. And plus, Ejero Evero. I mean, like I, I talked about this some yesterday with the Brian Flores, Ejero Evero stuff, but man, I, I loved Phil Snow as a DC. I think that was one of the few things that Matt Rule did a really good job on, uh, and I'm really excited to see Phil Snow just dominate uh, at Nebraska, because if he was that good of an NFL DC, then good lord, uh, good luck college football. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, I was I was like, man, that's, that's, that's a tough job to replace. Like, I had a lot of respect. I thought Phil Snow was a really, really good DC, even though nobody really talked about him, unless you were a Carolina fan. Jero Evero, man, like that <laughs> might be an upgrade. I mean, uh, even though he's only had one year as a DC, and that was last year with a talented Denver team, I mean, 
I, I think it's hard not to have him in that top 10 conversation. So awesome hire there for Carolina. So if you give him this type of an edge rusher, and then we are going to eventually go secondary later on, I think we're just finding those little bit of holes that could be there on the Carolina defense. Linebacker's also plausible here because I don't know if you can keep Shaq Thompson with a $24 million cap hit. So he could be on his way out, maybe linebacker here. But nonetheless, let's just give Ejero Evero as many fun toys that he could play with as a sandbox, right? Then we get to the Saints here at 40. With Michael Mayer in the first round. Uh, and now I'm going to go edge here with Will McDonald. So I've been going defensive tackle edge, but decided to go tight end edge here. I think it's a nicer, uh, more even balance, right? Offense and defense. Uh, but Will McDonald, man, uh, another guy who looked really good at the senior bowl. He's your typical speed rusher. Like uh, that's the easiest way to you know, classify who he is. 6'3", right around 240 pounds. And he's going to attack offensive tackles outside shoulder. Uh, and he can win with speed and he's got some good bends. So that's who he is. I'd love to be able to see him add that out or inside counter. I beg your pardon. Uh, but this is a New Orleans team that prioritizes edge depth and you may lose Marcus Davenport. So adding Will McDonald in as a guy who can kind of rotate in with Cam Jordan and Peyton Turner, I think that's something the Saints are going to prioritize, especially when they have uh, their former defensive coordinator as their head coach going into the second season in Dennis Allen. So I think that's something that's on the front of Dennis Allen's mind. This has been a very Mickey Loomis kind of track record, prioritizing edge depth. And I think Will McDonald is a really good value. He's that fringe late day one, early day two type of guy. So here at 40, I think you're getting good value. Then we get to the Tennessee Titans, and I'm going to give you Jalen Hyatt. I promised in yesterday's video I was going to give you that speed receiver. So we went Broderick Jones, and I was like, yeah, that's that ground and pound, moving people, you know, Derrick Henry's our guy type of move. And and we're going to continue that trend once we get to day three in tomorrow's video. But, or excuse me, round three in tomorrow's video. But then Jalen Hyatt plus Traylon Burks, who really did impress me a lot more than I thought. I was I was not that high on Traylon Burks. I was much more you know lukewarm on him. But I think with what we got to see when he was on the field last year, he, he started he's proving me wrong. He can do a lot more deep down the field than I anticipated. Add in a Jalen Hyatt, a guy who's going to run in the four twos, and I mean ask Alabama about Jalen Hyatt as a deep threat. They'll let you know all about it. So. Yeah, I mean, I think he has a limited route tree. I think Josh Heupel offense inflates his numbers, but nonetheless, speed talks. And uh, I think when you're a ground and pound team and Derrick Henry is your identity, play action, it takes one false step, one mistake from a, from a secondary, a corner, safety, whatever the coverage is, takes that one mistake against that coverage, and Jalen Hyatt's behind you. And that makes the Tennessee Titans so much scarier. So we got him that people move in left tackle that feels like what the Titans want to do. We're going to do the same thing with left guard in tomorrow's video. Now let's give you that speed receiver to pair up with Traylon Burks, and let's try to round out and finish off that wide receiver room in a way that I think really combats the main strength of that offense with Derrick Henry in that run game. Let's talk about the Cleveland Browns here. I've been going interior defensive line, Siaki Eek, over the last couple of mocks, but this time I'm going to go Josh Downs. I think they can get an upgrade at the uh, slot receiver spot. Then you have Amari Cooper as your main, your ex. Uh, kind of do a little bit of everything. Mainly be the possession guy. Donovan Peoples-Jones is the big body vertical dude. He's basically just a poor man's Gabe Davis. And then Josh Downs inserted in that picture as an awesome satellite weapon, can work from the slot. He said he thinks he can play on the outside. I do think he ends up being slot only at the next, next level, but I'm here for exploring and finding out, right? Um, and on top of that, a guy who has twitchy speed. I mean, this guy can work down the field. Uh, and I don't know if he's necessarily a great route runner. A lot of times if he was working, you know, beyond the line of scrimmage, there's a lot of crossing routes. But we saw how Green Bay pivoted midway through last year and started using Christian Watson on crossing routes as opposed to traditional, you know, goes and posts and digs, those things with sharp cuts, because he wasn't there as a route runner. But you get him on those crossers and you're just saying, hey, run generally in this direction, in this type of shape, and just be faster than the dude across from you. Well, Josh Downs, you put him in that type of role, he will thrive. Uh, I think that on top of his satellite ability for that Cleveland offense, that's how you maximize Deshaun Watson, who, you know, didn't really look all that great last year. So let's get him some help. Let's let's get him another weapon to work with. And I think Josh Downs at 42, I think that's really good value. Next up, the New York Jets. And I am sorry, Jets fans, you're probably so tired of seeing off of the tackle and safety, but man, I'm sorry. Outside of quarterback, your roster is pretty damn good, man. So uh, I do hope you can give me some uh, some for forgiveness. But and Jamie Robinson's my guy. That's one of my favorite safeties in this class. Has played all over the field. Free, strong, nickel. I mean, whatever the Jets need him to do, Jamie Robinson can do it. He'll do it at a high level. Good size. He's got the NFL frame. Good athletic ability, too. I'm really excited to see what his combine numbers look like, just so I can officially you know, kind of check that box. Uh, but him and Jordan Whitehead, another guy who's moved all over the field during his time at Tampa and even with the Jets, yeah, I mean, I love DBs that you can move around and confuse offenses with, and pairing Jamie Robinson up with Jordan Whitehead, that's how you do it. Falcons at pick 44. I'm going to go edge Isaiah Foskey. Again, yesterday we went Brian Branch, and I was like, hey, trust me, we're going to go edge. I think it's a strength this class, so why don't, why don't we wait and get you just one of the best players in the draft class in Brian Branch. Uh, so now we're going to give you Isaiah Foskey. Uh, 
And, you know, he got moved around a little bit at the Senior Bowl. Like, you know, the clip against Dewan Jones was not great. Um, but I still believe in a guy who, you know, who's 6'4", right around 260, 265. Uh, especially, you know, uh, I think a guy who could play 3-4 or 4-3. I'd rather see him in a 4-3. Uh, but nonetheless, I think he can be a stand-up outside edge rusher. Foskey is an interesting guy because, like, let's take Arnold Ebiketti from last year's uh, second-round selection from Atlanta. I can tell you what he wins with. He wins with speed, bend, and he's a finesse rusher. Like, that's his go-to. Foskey's... Solid against the run, solid as, you know, uh, pass rusher that wins with strength. Got a couple moves, not necessarily super twitchy, but he's a solid athlete. And that just, that's who Isaiah Bosky is. You know, he's good at a lot of different things, but a master at none of it. But for Atlanta, that's kind of an interesting pairing, adding him in with an Arnold Abikenny and a D'Angelo Malone. Starting to add more resources into that edge group. And if Isaiah Bosky hits... Ideally, then the ball continues to roll. Those other dominoes fall, and those other guys take a step forward. So you had an awesome defensive player like Brian Branch. You can do a lot of different things with. Add an Isaiah Foskey. Address some edge depth. You could also go on B.J. Ojolari. He looks in D.K. Uzama. Derek Hall. The reason I didn't go with those guys is because they're also a little smaller, just like Ebiketti. So it feels like you don't want two of those lighter not great against the run type of edge defenders out there. So Foskey feels like he gives you a little bit more against the run, a little bit more weight as well. So that that's ultimately why I went with Foskey. That was kind of the tiebreaker there. Let me get to Green Bay at 45. Uh, this is where I'm going to have them go tight end. And, dude, Darnell Washington to Green Bay. I mean, uh, Coach LaFleur is losing his mind at this. I mean, like, you're basically getting a sixth offensive lineman. So no matter what happens with Bakhtiari, is he going to be cut? Whatever. Josh Yaman, can you get him back? Whatever. Darnell Washington, whoever ends up uh, being the tackle at left or right tackle, Darnell Washington's going to be there to help. Uh, you're basically getting a fifth and a half. I like to say sixth offensive lineman, but you know, he's still a tight end. So let's go to a fifth and a half offensive lineman. But that said, Darnell Washington, pass blocking sets and wins against Gervon Dexter and B.J. Ojolari. Two guys that I think are ultimately going to go top 100, and that's where I have them both going. Actually, Dexter just outside the top 100. He's in tomorrow's video. So... Yeah, I mean, Darnell Washington, that plus six foot seven, 260 pounds. I mean, Robert Tunyon's route tree was anything but expansive. And I think Darnell Washington, minimum, can give you those routes plus an awesome extra blocker on the field, run blocking, pass blocking, whatever it is. This is a this is a fit that I'm all about. Now, granted, I've had them take Michael Mayer in the first round. I've had them take Dalton Kincaid, Luke Musgrave here in the second. And Darnell Washington's not that level of receiver, but 6'7", 260, he moves pretty well for that size. I think there's potential to add on to that. Uh, but really, you're drafting him as a high-end blocker, plus the fact that he's got a sick frame and can move pretty well for that size. Let's get to the New England Patriots at 46. Uh, this is where I'm going to have Keely Ringo's uh, slide come to a close. I mean, man press corner, uh, six foot two, long arms. I think it's going to run 4-3. I mean, this is screaming Bill Belichick to me, is it not to you? Uh, also, if you're a Patriots fan and worried, we are going to go off to tackle tomorrow. So to me, wide receiver, tackle, corner. If the Patriots can go through the first three rounds and get those three position groups targeted, feeling pretty good. Uh, linebacker could also be considered for sure. But here, get Keely Ringo, a guy who feels like uh, exactly what Bill Belichick would want in his corners of old. Uh, pair him up with Jack Jones, who was pretty solid, especially early on last year. You still have Marcus Jones there in the slot. Um, I think Jonathan Jones is a free agent. Should have double-checked that before the recording, but nonetheless, let me know if he is down below in the comment section. If you lose him, Ringo, a plug-and-play replacement, or Jonathan Jones just becomes a guy who's just depth, which you can never have enough corner depth. So, love this fit, and this is a guy I've had go in the first round as, you know, earlier mocks as high as the top 10, but of late, more so the teens to 20s. So, getting him at 46... Yeah, that's, that's excellent value. So we get to Washington at 47. I'm going to go Andrew Voorhees. I've had this pick a couple times. So we went Brian Brzee. Now we're going Andrew Voorhees. Uh, you know, very trench focused here uh, for Washington. But part of that is also like, they got good wide receivers. Uh, they could go corner. We're going to do corner tomorrow. So that's this is the one This is the one time on my channel I haven't had a mock where corner has been one of the first two rounds. But nonetheless, you know, uh, that pass rush should, you know, keep those, uh, they keep the secondary clean. They actually have a couple of nice safeties. And it really comes down to quarterback, whether it's Sam Howell or they get someone else. That's the big domino that they need to fall in the right direction. So let's go Andrew Voorhees. This is your upgrade over Andrew Norwell, a guy who played a ton at USC. I feel like is a plug-and-play, ready-to-go guy at the NFL level. So it makes a ton of sense. And, you know, with Brzee, yeah, maybe a little bit of a develop window, but I think you can get him on the field right away. Same thing here with Voorhees because this is a Washington team that was kind of flirting with the playoffs last year. If they do get an upgrade at quarterback play, they're certainly live for the playoff conversation. Next is the Detroit Lions. So we've gone corner. We went running back. And now I'm going to go Jack Campbell here at 48. Man, the more I watch him, the more I like Jack Campbell. I know he's not an insane athlete, but just plays the position right. You know, I saw somebody, I can't remember who tweeted it, and I really do apologize for this. And they said, I wish I could take Jack Campbell, put him in a time machine, and drop him in the NFL two decades ago. You put Jack Campbell in 2003, 
this dude uh, is just thriving. <laughs> this guy is easily a first rounder because he plays the run so well and he's so instinctual. And, you know, he actually held up okay in coverage this year. I just think once you translate to the NFL and the speed of that game, the speed of tight ends and running backs, that's where I think his athletic limitations are going to be shown a little bit. That said, I, you know, it didn't feel as glaring this year. But again, playing at Iowa, different level of competition versus the NFL. But man, if the play's in front of him, he's great. He can fill run lanes. He's a sure tackler. Uh, and not much of a pass rusher. So uh, kind of your old school two down linebacker. Uh, but I'd be really interested to see if there's a team that's willing to maybe see if he can test out and, and be a uh, you know three down linebacker. And really, if he has a better 40 time than what we're expecting, this guy becomes, I don't want to say potential first rounder, but he becomes one of the first guys that could potentially come off the board on day two. Uh, if his 40 times better than what we're thinking it might be. So uh, if he's got more speed than we think, his name's going to go up in value. But even right now, 48 pairing him up with Malcolm Rodriguez. Ugh. That is a perfect pairing there on the inside. Your old school, you know, prototypical Jack Campbell, and then your, you know, a uh, little bit smaller but super twitchy high end athlete in Rodriguez. It's a it's a really nice pairing there in the middle for Detroit. Next is Pittsburgh. I'm going to go Siaki Ika, uh, one of my favorite players in this class. And 49, I think it's great value. This is your potential D tackle of the future. And maybe even you could play him at three tech, but 358 pounds. I'm thinking this is a nose tackle of the future. Um, I do think uh, at the NFL level, he'll be able to become a guy who holds the line of scrimmage better than he did at Baylor. I think that's you know parting a part of coaching and how you know just Baylor approaches you know their program and what they want to do. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, 358 pounds, that should be a guy who holds the line of scrimmage. But he's also a guy who's got, you know, some sneaky uh, sneaky moves in there. Like, this guy's got a spin move. He's got a nice swim move, too. Uh, so he's got some pass rush upside. And plus, again, if you think he's going to hold the line better and play more with strength in his profile, which the almost 360 or almost 360 pound frame would suggest, like the bull rush is potentially there to, to kind of uh, hone in on with some time. So. I think this is a guy who is going to get better at the NFL level. Already kind of has that finesse pass rush profile in his game. Make him a better run defender. Figure out how to hold the line. Maybe add that bull rush. This guy becomes really, really scary. And you're talking about adding him to a defense with TJ Watt, Cam Hayward, and Alex Highsmith coming off a good year too. So, yeah, I mean, Pittsburgh's already known for their pass rush. Add Eek in there. That is, that's a scary type of addition. Plus, ideally, a guy who can help them stop the run at a higher level than Tyson Aluwalu and, and, and company from last year. Then we get to Tampa Bay at pick 50 with Anthony Richardson yesterday. And today we're going to go Deontay Banks, the corner from Maryland. Six foot two, right around 200 pounds. Um, you know, was was at the ball, uh, at the catch point a lot. Just ultimately didn't win it, which, you know, some of that's luck, some of that's his skill. But uh, didn't also play a whole lot of press coverage when this guy profiles as a really good press man corner. So I think a different scheme will certainly open up his game and, and make him a better player, kind of like we were talking about with Ika. Uh, some of it comes back ultimately to your program and how you've been coached and how you've been, you know, what, what your role was. Uh, but also, you know, Tampa Bay, you know, we kind of talked about this yesterday. I don't know which direction they're going to go, win it all, try to run it back and go for it all with Derek Carr or – move on from some veterans and not re-sign a Jamel Dean, not re-sign a Sean Murphy bunting and say, hey, it's Kyle Trask slash Anthony Richardson in this case. And uh, we're just going to see where the season goes. And then that will dictate if we got our franchise quarterback or if we're taking Keelan Williams 2024, something like that. Uh, but drafting Deontay Banks is a safe hedge because I don't think they can keep both those corners uh, and Dean and Sean Murphy bunting. So this, no matter what, feels like a need. But they could also lose that on both. Then it becomes a dire need. So I think Banks here at 50, a guy that's been in plenty of first-round mocks, it's really solid value. Then we get to the Miami Dolphins at pick 51. I'm going to go Jameer Gibbs here. Um, you know, I've had this, I've, I've made this selection a couple times, but that type of speed running back with good elusiveness, really solid vision in a zone scheme or gap scheme, however you want to describe it. Yeah, I'm absolutely here for it. <laughs> and plus, you know, if Mike McDaniel's anything like Kyle Shanahan, he's going to draft a running back relatively high. So uh, I think Jameer Gibbs is more than live here. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting. You know, you looked at James Cook last year, and I used to say all the time, he's kind of like, if you describe Dalvin Cook at his best, like prime Dalvin Cook as the A version, like the A grade version of Dalvin Cook. James Cook's kind of like the B, the B minus version of that. And then, you know, Jameer Gibbs, I think, is slightly better. So maybe the B-plus version of Dalvin Cook, you know. So uh, if, if you're comparing this all on a scale and if Dalvin Cook's your A, I think Jameer Gibbs is that B-plus type of version of him. And then James Cook, B-minus. So if you like James Cook, I think there's a lot to like about Jameer Gibbs. Also a really good receiver. So adding that type of speed into the offense as well is super exciting. I did Devin A-chain last week in the third round. 
that could totally be plausible. Uh, but here in the second round, go get the second best running back in the draft class, in my opinion, a guy who can catch out of the backfield and you're adding more speed when an offense already has Jalen Waddell and Tyree Kill. That sounds super awesome to me. Then we get to Seattle, and I'm going to go defensive line. So we've gone Tyree Wilson to address edge, but also a guy in kick inside, into your offensive line, and linebacker. And now I'm going to give you Keanu Benton. Behind Siaki Ike, I think the next best uh, nose tackle in the class and already a high-level run defender at Wisconsin. We even kind of saw that on the senior circuit. So, uh, yeah, just a guy I think is NFL ready. Kind of a similar theme I've been putting together here for the Seahawks. Uh, and another guy that you can plug in the middle of that defense depending on what happens with some of the veterans they have on that roster, whether they start to take a dip in play or ultimately the contract becomes too expansive and they want to move on from him. So uh, this is a guy I think can see the field right away and give you an immediate uh, boost in run stop because especially leading up to their playoff push, like they kind of got hot week 17, 18, but there was like a three or four, maybe even a little bit longer stretch, uh, you know, weeks, what would that be, 13 through 16, 12 through 16, something like that, where they really were getting gashed by the run game. So adding a Keanu Ben, I think, really shores that up. Plus, we already added Henley earlier on here in the second round. Then we get back to Chicago here at pick 53. I'm going to go Dewan Jones. Uh, just feels like the right place for him to go, this or Baltimore, because you can't rush Lamar Jackson and Justin Fields like Tom Brady or Matt Stafford or one of these more statue-esque quarterbacks, Jimmy Garoppolo, just to name another one. Those guys are such gifted athletes, and they can the second they get the opportunity to break the pocket, they can. And if they get by you, you ain't catching up. Uh, so you can't play them legit. You have to play with a contain. And I think that kind of alleviates some of the concerns I have about Dewan Jones as maybe not the next most polished pass rusher or pass protector, and also a guy who would struggle against you know smaller speed rushers. Uh, so I think Justin Fields kind of buys Dewan Jones some protection against some of his weaknesses. But then on top of that, he's six foot eight and he throws people around like it's it, well, it is his job, but quite literally like it's his job. I mean, this dude at the Senior Bowl was making. Andre Carter look like he was nothing, and that dude's 6'7", 260. He made Isaiah Foskey look like an ant, and he's 6'4", 260. Yeah, I, I mean, this dude has special strength. So adding him into an offense, I mean, now it's a it's a zone, you know, gap scheme again, to use that phrase. I don't know how well, you know, Jones fares on his feet maybe in that, that offense, but nonetheless, you bully the dude across from you, and then we'll figure out the rest, right? So I think this is an offense that really kind of caters to Dewan Jones' weaknesses, and, you know, hey, it's an area of need. So we've gone JSN, we've gone right tackle, addressing the two things that I think will help improve Justin Fields' game. Like, how long have we been saying they need wide receivers, they need offensive line reinforcements? Well, that's exactly what I've given Chicago here in round two. Next is the Los Angeles Chargers. And, uh, you know, because we had Benton and we've already had uh, Ike come off the board, I'm kind of maybe reaching a little bit. But Monty Smith's an interesting add to this defense, right? Six foot three, almost 340 pounds. Number one uh, name on Bruce Feldman's freak list. I mean, this guy's a freak athlete, so there's a lot of potential to be tapped into. Inconsistent when he looked good, man. It was like, yeah, this guy has a role at the NFL. And then there's games where he disappears. So something to be worked out there. But, you know, this is an LA team that, you know, Sign Sebastian Joseph Day. Sign an Austin Johnson. So I could see Mozzie Smith maybe even taking a year with limited production, and then you kind of work his way into a larger role year two, year three. Or if Sebastian Joseph Day, Austin Johnson continue to battle injuries, well, Mozzie Smith is just going to be forced out there, and he's going to have to learn on the fly. But now you have that contingency. You have that depth. And this is an area where the Chargers have to get better, right? Like they want to have light boxes. They want to play too high. They don't want to rotate a safety down into the box. You got to have that mean run-stopping nose tackle. And... Mozzie Smith ain't 360 pounds like Siaki Ika. He's close to 340, but he's also a twitchy athlete. And anytime you talk about a guy like that who can split blocks and you know, get to a spot before into your offensive lineman, it, it's something worth investing in. So here at 54, I like it for the Chargers. Next, we get back to the Detroit Lions. So we've gone corner, we've gone running back, we've gone linebacker. And now I'm going to go Sidney Brown. I've made this pick a couple times in the third round, but after a good senior bowl, I'm, I'm thinking he's more of a second round guy versus the third, but pair him up with Kirby Joseph. I mean, that would be a fun storyline, getting those safeties back together, former fighting Illini. Uh, and also, I just I think a spot where the Lions can get better and we're just addressing every spot on the defense that we possibly can. I mean, there was, you know, what, the first 12 weeks of the year where the Lions statistically were like the worst defense in NFL history. So let's go ahead and take that into consideration and try to fix that, right? So uh, adding a Sidney Brown in the mix, I really, really like that type of addition. And again, pairing him up with Kirby Joseph, their skill sets kind of align. They play well off of each other. So uh, Brown maybe is the box uh, safety. Joseph is the guy over top. I am absolutely here for that. And plus Devon Witherspoon in the, in the first round at pick six, three fighting Illini. I mean, that's a story waiting to be made. But, uh, yeah, really addressing that secondary, really trying to address that defense as a whole and patch it up. Next, Jacksonville Jaguars at 56. 
Let's go ahead and give them the third tight end off the board. Luke Musgrave, I know I've said this a thousand times. Him, whether Evan Ingram is there or not, I think makes sense. Doug Peterson can either totally live in a world where he has two tight ends that are really good. Uh, did you watch him in Philadelphia with Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard? That worked out just fine. Uh, or this is your Evan Ingram replacement, which, you know, like I said in yesterday's video, I anticipate them cutting Shaq Griffin. They're going to have to make some other roster cuts because they're over the cap. So Evan Ingram, depending on how big of a contract he fetches and, you know, still in his 20s coming off a career year, uh, he he's going to be a hot commodity, I think. So uh, he might be priced out of Jacksonville's, you know, uh, spending limit maybe for that position. So go ahead and getting a guy like Luke Musgrave, get cheaper, get younger, have four years of control at the position. I think it makes a lot of sense. Next is the New York Giants, and I'm going to give them a perfect fit for Wink Martindale. This guy, Tyreek Stevenson, was awesome at the Senior Bowl in man press. I mean, there were not a lot of corners I could touch Tank Dell, and there were not a lot of wide receivers that could get off the line against Tyreek Stevenson. So this feels like the exact man coverage type of corner that Wink Martindale is looking for. Pair him up with a Dory Jackson. And man, this team gets scary. Hopefully, they can keep Julian Love as this you know slot corner safety hybrid, and then that secondary starts to look really, really scary for the Giants. And we're gonna go pass rushing linebacker with one of the two third round picks we have in tomorrow's video. So really excited about you know kind of the direction this Giants defense could be heading. Now there's some work to obviously still be done on the offensive side. I think they could use another interior offensive lineman. That's the other pick we're gonna make in tomorrow's video. We added a wide receiver already, so let's go ahead and get that man press corner. And plus at 57, Stevenson's gone in the first round in my box. He's gone in the first round in plenty of other people's mocks and people who are way smarter than me, like Daniel Jeremiah and Mel Kuyper Jr. So, yeah, uh, I think here at 57, that is fantastic value. So next up is the Dallas Cowboys at 58. And, man, I would just love to see this team add that speed wide receiver into the mix. I mean, we saw a little bit of that with T.Y. Hilton. And, you know, Keyshawn Butte is kind of a, a tricky player because the game's there, the speed talks, and, you know, like that's the most important element. That's mostly what teams are going to focus on. Uh, a little bit of a quieter year this year at LSU, but go back two seasons ago prior to his injury, which also that's kind of a complicating factor here. But the dude looked really, really good. Can do a lot of different stuff. Can be a satellite guy. Can be a D route runner. Can be that burner. But again, getting back to that T.Y. Hilton role, I think Butte has what it takes to be able to play on the outside. I'd like to see C.D. Lamb be able to have 60-70% of his snaps on the inside playing on that slot role. And I think Butte gives you the flexibility to play out wide and again, fill that T.Y. Hilton role. So I think a fit that makes sense. Dallas has been looking for that speed wide receiver. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it adds up and checks a lot of different boxes for what the Cowboys are looking for. Then we get to the Buffalo Bills. And, you know, I mean, what a value here. Emmanuel Forbes, I mean, another guy where another corner that's been in first round mocks of my own and plenty of others. Uh, but, you know, three year starter at Mississippi State, plenty of ball production. Uh, and, you know, I've had a plenty, a lot of Bills fans actually point out, hey, Christian Benford could move to safety depending on what happens. And I think that's a great point. So, if that does happen, let's go ahead and add some corner depth instead. And let's add an Emmanuel Forbes, who, again, has been a first-rounder for me plenty of times and for others plenty of other times as well. So getting him at 59 is just extremely good value. So getting a guy who could potentially start right away, again, plenty of playing time under his belt already at Mississippi State. So and kind of a school that's kind of weirdly become a great cornerback uh, developer, Cam Dantzler, uh, and other names whose names now are escaping me. But uh, Emmanuel Forbes, really interesting ad, really fun player, six foot, 190 pounds. Uh, and yeah, I mean, a team that can kind of like the Chiefs that we've talked about a ton, they're going to be playing from ahead a lot. So adding edge, adding corner depth, never a bad thing. I think the same thing is true here for the Bills. Then we get to the Cincinnati Bengals, and I'm going to stick in the cornerback room. I'm going to go Eli Ricks. Um, yeah, really interesting player. When we've gotten to see him on the field, he's been really good, both with LSU and Alabama. Unfortunately, a little slow to get on the field at Alabama this year, so a little bit of a concern there. I'd love to be able to be a part of that interview process, get a little bit more insight of that, but hey, I work with the knowledge that I have. Uh, also, a, a team that's trying to add more and more corner depth, uh, so I think adding Eli Ricks is going to be great value and someone who could step onto the field pretty quickly. Um and then depending on what happens with Cam Taylor Britt, I, I still think of him maybe as the Von Bell replacement. We'll see. Obviously, once get to free agency, if Von Bell gets a contract extension, cool. Uh, Cam Taylor Britt then is going to be sticking at corner and adding Eli Ricks in with Chidobe Wuzier and Mike Hilton, who I believe is going to the last year of his deal. Cool. You're just adding some more corner depth and some contingency plans there in place. Or if, if Cam Taylor Britt does ultimately become that Von Bell replacement, Eli Ricks is one of your top three corners and a guy who's going to see the field. So uh, either way you spend it, I think it's a worthwhile pick here for Cincinnati. Uh, as promised, we are going to go to the secondary here for Carolina because I did think about you know Ringo at 39. Uh, and here I'm going to go Garrett Williams, the corner from Syracuse. Actually, three straight corners coming off the board. But hey, it's a loaded corner class. We're going to probably see a run similar to this at some point. Uh, but a guy who, if not for that injury at Notre Dame, I would have loved to see how his season ended. We were all kind of waiting for that breakout year for him at Syracuse. But there was a reason for that, right? Because the two years prior, 
he was getting better and better. He has good size, good athletic, uh, you know, athletic ability. I think enough to be able to play at the NFL level. That's another guy who's six foot, 190. So you know, that feels small compared to a Gonzalez and a Porter Jr. But that's still, you know, in the grand scheme of it, pretty good size for an NFL corner. So adding him as the guy who plays opposite of J.C. Horn. I'm here for it. Uh, you know, uh, I could see him going as high as early round two. So I think you're getting good value here. And honestly, J.C. Horn's a superstar. I just need a competent guy on the other side. So you look at this hall for Carolina. We got Andre Carter the second to play opposite of a superstar in Brian Burns. Garrett Williams to play opposite of a superstar in J.C. Horn. And we draft C.J. Stroud at nine. I mean, if this were the hall for Carolina, my God. I mean, that, that, that team to me would be really, really scary. And I mean, maybe even my pick to win the division despite having a rookie quarterback. Let me know if you're a Panthers fan. I, I, I mean, I think this is three for three in my opinion. Obviously, I'm the guy making the mark. So let me get to the Eagles. Two more picks to go. And I'm going to introduce you to the next uh, superstar offensive lineman for the Philadelphia Eagles, if this were the pick. Cody Mock. I mean, I, I said yesterday Philadelphia is like the top place that comes to mind for developing edge rushers. Well, they also took a former rugby player in the seventh round and made him into one of the best tackles in football. So, yeah, if they can do that with Jordan Mailata, I am really interested to see what they can do with Cody Mock, who high-end athlete, new offensive lineman, uh, but already a really good run blocker because he just flies around the field and, you know, uh, force is mass times velocity. And when this dude gets ahead of steam, there's a lot of velocity. Even though he might need to add a little bit more mass, uh, this dude can bring the force because of that. So just to get a little bit of physics lessons in for your Saturday afternoon. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, same thing with Miles Murphy. Like if Cody Mock went to Philadelphia, I don't know how, but he would somehow become the next like seven year pro bowler <laughs> after like a year of sitting. So uh, this would be the perfect place for him to grow and develop. I think he'd start at guard and then move out to tackle if they needed it, or maybe be an interior offensive lineman who could kick out and be their swing tackle or something like that so also that flexibility has got to be something that's appealing uh to philadelphia who's going to be losing andre dillard this year in free agency last pick we'll talk about in today's video kansas city uh you know i was thinking about juju smith schuster he's hitting free agency so i'm gonna go ahead and go parker washington here at 63 uh he's a receiver i like a ton my wide receiver seven in my latest wide receiver rankings uh a guy who Good enough athletic ability, good enough route runner, but you sprinkle in some really savvy, some really nice sneaky uh, contested catch ability. Guy can go win in the air, solid size too. Uh, so I think a guy who could just step in immediately in that Juju Smith-Schuster role there playing the slot and, and give you that same level of production, if not more, because Juju is plenty quiet throughout points of this year. Uh, but I could also, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about who they have on roster at this moment. Kadarius Toney, Sky Moore, Marquez Valdez, Scantling. So they, you know, maybe Sky Moore moves in that slot role, but I'd like to see Parker Washington maybe uh, and then you can keep Sky Moore as this you know satellite gadget maybe even playing on the outside some and a punt returner if he you know, stops muffing him like he had a bad problem and a bad habit of doing uh, this past year as a rookie so uh, interesting fit I did consider Rasheed Rice or Michael Wilson so if you are a Chiefs fan I was considering that bigger body possession contested catch guy like uh, you know I think Michael Wilson actually has a little bit more route running ability than a Rasheed Rice but one of those bigger guys who could be your potential X receiver or something along those lines. But that is going to do it for the round two portion of my updated 2023 NFL mock draft. Again, I will scroll across the top so you can get a reminder of all the picks that I made. But let me hear your thoughts down below in the comment section. Who's your favorite team? That certainly goes a long way for me to know uh, what you're talking about, what picks you do or don't like. But whether you liked them or mid, you know, kind of in the middle about it or you hated them, I'd love to hear your feedback and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, it's been awesome to hear that, uh, that feedback and, and that response from all of you over the past uh, month or two. So I uh, hope to have that continue. So that is going to do it for the second round portion of this updated 2023 mock. But until tomorrow, when I give you round three of the updated mock draft, my name is Teach, and I'm signing off. <laughs>